a warm welcome to those who are tuning in and it's great to have internet and we appreciate that and thank God for it. So a warm welcome uh, tonight. As you know, we're on the theme of revival and uh, we've been looking over the past few months at different aspects. We started off with the theme of preparing ourselves for revival, preparation for revival, and that's ongoing because God's continually doing a work in us and renewing our minds and our attitudes and so on. Then we moved from preparing to positioning ourselves for revival and we, we focused on the importance of walking in unity. And again, that's important because, you know, the enemy tries to get in there and, and sow seeds of discord. So we must maintain the unity, as we're told in Ephesians, maintain that spirit of unity. Then we looked at the importance of praying for revival and as you know we've stepped up our praying here for revival uh, every other week at the moment it seems to be uh, that we are focusing on that aspect so and in our individual lives as well we're encouraging you all uh, to pray uh, with prevailing prayer so that's ongoing as well for it's prevailing prayer it's praying until it happens amen and tonight I want us to think of perceiving Revival. In other words, seeing it with the eyes of faith. For that is so important. Perceiving revival. Because if we're going to pray as we ought, we need to pray with expectancy and with faith. We need to see it and believe it. So tonight's title is simply Perceiving Revival. Can you see this nation transformed by the power of God? Can you see it? Can you see it? You know, many indeed see the need for revival, but can you actually see revival happening itself? Can you see it? And can you see the church arising from this state of dormancy and apathy and complacency and compromise? Can you see it arising from this and going through the motions to being motivated? to once again seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness alone. Can you see that? Can you see a resurfacing of that first love and passion for God that drives us to our knees in worship? A refreshing coming again upon God's people, a refreshing from the presence of the Lord. Can you see a return to a hunger for the word of God? Where just like in the days of Nehemiah, it said, bring the word. The people said, look, bring us the word. They were hungry. What does God say? We want the God's words in this situation. And thus saith the Lord is what we need. Can you see that happening? Can you see an appreciation arising afresh of God's holiness? His holiness leading people to personal and corporate repentance for sin. Because that's what the Bible says we need. Can you see it? Can you see it with the eyes of faith? Do you remember Ezekiel saw it? Ezekiel 37. Do you remember that when God led him to that, that valley of dry bones and got him to look over at the bones? And he saw the many bones. He says they are many and they're very dry. He looked at the situation of what it was like. Many people, very dry. And God told him, he says, speak prophecy to those bones, preach the word onto those bones and they shall live. And Ezekiel did. And it says, as he went, remember, there was a noise and there was a shaking and the bones came together. And remember, they stood up as the breath of God came upon them. They came alive and they stood to their feet, it says. And they were an exceeding great army. Folks, we need to see this happening in our nations. For there are many bones that are very dry. Many bones. But folks, when they hear the word of the Lord, when they seek God and hear God's word and the word that's alive and full of power is spoken into their lives, I believe there's going to be some noise in this land. There'll be the noise of rejoicing. There'll be a noise of people crying out in repentance. There will be a noise from the opposition saying, oh, that's not of God. But folks, there will be the naysayers too. But there will be a noise and there will be a shaking in this nation. I believe it. A shaking of the church. 
And I believe the bones are coming together to, for God's purposes. And I believe that they are coming alive, revived, afresh again. I believe they're rising to their feet, a mighty, exceeding army that will march through this land to a totally different drumbeat in the name of Jesus, under the banner of God's love. I see it. I believe it. I see it. That wasn't where I was going to go, but praise God. <laughs> and that was Ezekiel's vision. But that's what I see too. Dry bones. Hearing the word of the Lord. What I did write was, can you see our nation radically altered with worldly lifestyles renounced? And can you see the effects of revival uh, going beyond our borders into the nations of the world? Folks, I believe the spirit is going to move. All over the world, the spirit is moving. And there's going to be a mighty revelation of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Amen. And a mighty harvest of souls brought into his kingdom. So agree. Keep praying for this. But we need to see it first with the eyes of faith. You see, that's what they did in the Hebrides. They weren't just saying prayers. They saw it. That's how they could pray with such intensity. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. They believed that they were going to see this. Bible says, rain down, this is Isaiah 45 verse 8. Just rain down, O heavens from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open. Let salvation spring up and let righteousness grow in it. Powerful scripture to pray. And God himself says in the next chapter, sorry, the chapter before that, Isaiah 44, he says, I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in the meadow and like poplars by the flowing streams. You see, I believe anything God has done, he can do now. Do you believe that? Yeah. And I believe anything God has done anywhere, he can do here in this nation. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Do you perceive it? Do you believe God's going to reign righteousness upon this land again? Turn with me, please, to 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to start there tonight. 1 Kings 18, verses 41 to 45. Now, you're familiar with this. This is where Elijah has been praying for rain. He's praying for rain, but he didn't just pray for rain. He expected rain. And he didn't give up until he saw the rain. That's the key. Isaiah, or sorry, 1 Kings 18 and verse 41. It says, Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of the abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel. Then he bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees, and he said to his servant, go up now and look toward the sea. So he went up and looked and said, there's nothing. And seven times he said, go again. Then it came to pass the seventh time that he said, there's a cloud, as small as a man's hand, rising out of the sea. And he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind and there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah and he girded up his loins and he ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. This passage shows us that Elijah knew or perceived an abundance of rain was coming. He prayed and he kept on praying, as you can see here, even when the negative report came back to him saying, there's nothing. There's no evidence of it. Folks, people will say that. Like, what are you doing here? What are you praying for revival for? There's no evidence of it. Look at the way things are going. There's no evidence of it. But he kept on praying until he saw the evidence. You see, Habakkuk 2, 3 reminds us, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it shall speak. 
and it will not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. That's what God's word says. So on the seventh time, the servant comes back with the report. Behold, there arises a little cloud out of the sea. The servant, notice, saw a little cloud. But Elijah saw, what did he see? He saw a river forming and filling. He saw the ground soaking. He saw a mighty drought bursting deluge coming. He says to Ahab, look, get your chariot ready. Come on, get it ready. Go down before the rain stops you. That's praying with the eyes of faith and expectancy. Do you remember Abraham? Remember Abraham? God shared with him a lovely vision of what was going to happen. In Genesis, you're familiar with Genesis 12 too, where God promises him, I will make of thee a great nation and I'll bless thee and many and your name will be great and thou shalt be a blessing. Or as the Amplified says, I'll make of you a great nation. I'll bless you with abundant increase of favours. Make your name famous and distinguished and you shall be a blessing dispensing good to others. But you see, to get Abraham to perceive this and to see it with the eyes of faith, we need to go to chapter 15 and verse 5 where it says, Lord took Abraham outside and he says to him, look up into the sky and count the stars, if you can, that's how many descendants you will have. He needed to see it. He needed to visualize this. And we know from Romans 4 that he stepped out in faith. Now, go with me tonight to Isaiah 43. This is our main passage. Isaiah 43 and verse 18 to 19. We're going to see what God says to us. Isaiah 43. And verse, I'm going to read verse 19 first of all. It says, see, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. If you're reading the King James, it says, behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The major point I want us to look at here is where it says, shall you not know it? Shall you not perceive it? Or the Amplified, it says, shall you not perceive and know it and will you not give heed to it? You see, God wants to do something new and exciting. But it's up to you and to I to perceive it and to work with the new direction that he wants and has for us. So let's look closer because I think every word in this should be highlighted. In fact, if you look at it in my Bible, every word is highlighted. It's, it's underlined. It's got an asterisk and a lovely little star just to, so I can get quick reference to it. So let's just highlight those words. Literally, just the verse before, first of all, forget the former things, it says. Do not dwell on the past. What does he mean here? What does this mean? Forget the former things, do not dwell in the past. Well, even before this verse in the Bible, Isaiah, he lists out a few of the things that God did in the past in the chapter. He references how God had already rescued the Israelites from their captivity and made a way through the sea for them. That was amazing. He had already made a way through the sea. So he's not asking them to forget about this, for remember they were to teach this to their children and so on. But God's not asking us to erase the past from our memories, but he's asking us not to dwell on it. Not to dwell on it. He's asking us not to regard the past more than we regard the work that he wants to do today. He's admonishing us not to confine him to what he's already done. Yes, right. So we're not to camp out in the past mm -hmm. in what he's done. Right. It's good to celebrate it, mm -hmm. but we're not to look at it, to look back with it with such right. nostalgia right. that we cannot move forward in faith. Mm -hmm. 
We can see that clearly just in Psalm 85. It tells us, Lord, you've been merciful to our land. You've been favourable to our land. And it says, will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? It says, mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Then it says, truth shall spring out of the earth. And righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, Lord, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. In other words, God's words in the past, but there's a will. He will work again. He shall look down from heaven again. He shall give what's good. There's a future as well. So we're not allowed our past experiences uh, to hinder us, but they're to raise our expectations, not to confine us. That's why I love reading books of past revivals in all different countries and what God's done. It raises my expectations. What he's done before he can do again and more. Mm -hmm. God said to the prophet Haggai in 2 verse 9, he says, The glory of this present house will be greater. Well, sorry, the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. Says the Lord Almighty. Don't hinder him. So forget mm -hmm. The former things don't dwell on the past. Then he says, our verse tonight, behold, or see, or perceive. In other words, God wants your attention. He wants my attention. He's drawing us from whatever it was that we were looking at that wasn't him. Behold, he's saying, I want you to see something. I want you to perceive something. In fact, he asks it also in a question for me. He says, can you not perceive it? Can you not perceive it? And that is an important question for us to ask ourselves because many of God's people just don't perceive it. They don't perceive what God is doing. And you know, another way we could ask this, are you making room for it in your mind? Are you making room for this in your mind? Because our minds can be so cluttered with selfish things and other interests that there's no room to even perceive this. Are we willing to lay aside our logical way of thinking and embrace God's thoughts that are higher than our thoughts? His way of doing things could be different. Can you perceive it? Are you willing to embrace what God's doing? Behold, behold, he says. And the word for perceive here is the Hebrew word is yada. It's a very common word for no. No in the Bible. It's basically no, recognize, perceive. Can you not see it? Can you not recognize what God's doing? Can you not perceive this? In fact, one translation says, Clara, it means clarify your focus. Thought that was good. God's saying, maybe we need to clarify our focus. Can you clarify your focus to see what I'm doing? Clarify your focus. And it's the same word that we read earlier in our introduction tonight in Psalm 46, verse 10, where it says, be still and no, yada, that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I'll be exalted in the earth. No, perceive that I'm God. It was also used in Isaiah 40, verse 28, where God says, hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? Hast thou not known? Have you not perceived this yet? And do you remember Jesus, or in Mark chapter 8, verses eight, 17 to 18, it says, Jesus, being aware of this, that's the confusion in the disciples, said to them, why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Is your heart still hardened? Mm -hmm. Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? Do you not remember? He asks. So it's all about our perception. Don't you see what God is doing? You know, a little later in Isaiah, I stumbled across a verse. I don't remember seeing it before, but it stood out to me. It was Isaiah 49 and verses 8 to 9. It says, this is what the Lord says. In the time of my favour, mm -hmm. I will answer you. And in the day of salvation, I will help you. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people, to restore the land 
and to reassign its desolate inheritances, to say to the captives, come out, and to those in darkness, be free. They will feed beside the roads and find pastures on every barren hill. Beautiful. Can you see this? Do you know someone who needs salvation? Do you know of any captives that need to be set free and come out from the darkness? Come on, folks. What a beautiful verse. Can you see what God wants to do? So forget the former things. Don't dwell in the past. Behold, I'm going to do a new thing. I. It's all about God. Who's going to make a way? Who's going to do a new thing? It's God. God, I, that's the great, I am, it's, it's a God thing. It's going to be God inspired, it's God birthed, God initiated, nothing of man. It will be in his timing, it will be his doing and not of us. Mm. And that's ensuring that God gets the glory. And that is so, so important, mm. that God gets the glory. I, he says, I, that same God is in verse 1 of the same chapter here, who said, I have redeemed you. I have redeemed you. It's his work of redemption. I have called you by your name. You're mine. The same I, who, the same God in verse 2, I will be with you. The same I that's mentioned in verse 3, I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. The same God who in verse 4 says, I have loved you. The same God who in verse 5 here says, I've loved you again, just in case you didn't grasp it the first time. I have loved you. I've loved you. Verses, verse 11, I, even I am the Lord, and besides me there's no saviour. Same God. I. It's all about him. It's God we look upon. Our eyes are upon him. As our hymns tonight were saying, our eyes are upon him. And he says, behold, I will do a new thing, a new thing. That word new is powerful. In Hebrew, it means unprecedented, mm -hmm. unprecedented. It means fresh, it means unheard of. I will do something fresh. We all like fresh things, don't we? We like fresh food in our cupboards. It's not gone past the sell-by dates. We like fresh fruit and veg. And God loves freshness. I'm about to do something fresh, brand new. You've never walked this way before, he's saying. Do you remember the same word was used in Psalm 40 and verse 3 when he says, I'll put a new song in my mouth. He's put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. A new, a fresh song was rising up in him. He'd just been delivered. He'd been brought out of that horrible pit, out of the miry clay. And there's a new song, one he's never sung before, is rising up in him of praise to God. A fresh deliverance, a fresh song. That's the same word, new. You know in Lamentations 3 as well, where it tells us um, they are new, his blessings is, are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. He's talking about the mercies of God and the compassions that don't fail. They're new. Every morning, every morning you open your curtains. New mercies, new compassions, same word, fresh. I'm about to do a brand new thing. This is one of the translations. I'm about to do a brand new thing. Do you remember we read Joshua 3 in the last few months? It was where they were getting ready to cross the Jordan. Do you remember that? Verses 1 to 5. If you go there, verses 1 to 5. We'll read about the preparation just before they crossed over the river. Joshua 3, verses 1 to 5. It says, Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Acacia Grove, and they came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and they lodged there before they crossed over. And so it was after three days that the officers went through the camp, and they commanded the people, saying, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you must go. For you have not passed this way 
before. You have not passed this way before. And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Then Joshua spoke to the priests, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. Did you see the words there? Verse 4, You have not passed this way before. It was some new way, a new way God was working. You have never been this way before. You have never travelled this way before. Also reminds me of Mark 2 and verse 12. Remember the four friends that opened the roof to bring uh, uh, the man down to Jesus, a paralytic on a stretcher. It says, immediately he arose, took up his bed and went out of the house. He went out before them all and all were amazed and glorified God saying, we've never seen anything like this before. Or we have never seen it before in this fashion. Mm -hmm. We've never seen anything like this before. Behold, I'll do a new thing. A new thing. It says, now it shall spring forth. Now it shall spring forth. The Hebrew word for spring forth in verse 19 is the word for sprout. Sprout. Not Brussels sprout, but sprout. Sprout up. Now it shall sprout. Jesus, remember, in speaking of the entry into the kingdom, said, first the blades, then the heads, mm -hmm. and then the full grain in the heads. In other words, preliminary to even the visibility of the blades, above the ground there was a sprout beneath, beneath us. And what the Lord wanted us to understand was that he's going to do a new thing, but it's already in process. It's already happening. You can't see it yet. But it's set in motion. It's set in motion. Just like after the long, cold winter, there's a change going on inside the earth underground, preparing to bring the approach of spring and the seasons. You know, preparation for a time of growth and development and refreshing and fruitfulness, fragrance and beauty is still happening, even though it can't be seen in that season. See, I've already begun, says one translation. He's already begun. Even though maybe it's not with the eyes, natural eyes, visible, but with the eyes of faith, it is able to be grasped. You know, I'm amazed whenever I'm driving up to the school of the children, you know, in the spring, how the daffodils suddenly appear. You know, there's absolutely no sign, no sign of daffodils. For months on end and then all of a sudden you see them sprouting forth coming through right along sometimes i think oh they must have got rid of the daffodils they're not coming this year but without fail there they are in a beautiful array it's bursting out don't you see it isn't that beautiful bursting out don't you see it now it shall spring forth shall you not know it again it's saying we need to recognize you know, what God's doing and be in tune with his frequency. We need to flow in sync with the Spirit. For the Lord's calling us to walk in intimacy with him as we've never done before. A closer intimacy so that we can partner with him. You know, Jesus, who's our example, he lived and he walked this way. His whole life was simply ordered by the times of intimacy with his Father. And he made sure that he was in step with the Father every step of the way so we need to know it we need to perceive it he says i will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert i'll make a road i'll make a way a derrick is the hebrew word a way and once we understand god then we can truly sing that song you god will make a way where there seems to be no way he works in ways we cannot see he will make a way for me. He'll be my guide. He'll walk in closely by my side. With love and strength for each new day, God will make a way. Because he makes a way for us personally, and he makes a way for the church. You know, if you're in a difficult situation tonight, there's a way through it. God can make a way through and out of it. If you're unsaved tonight, he is the way. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the way to be saved. If you're tempted tonight 
Again, he says, there hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, and he will not suffer you to be tempted above what you are able. But with the temptation there is a way, he makes a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. So there's a way from that temptation. He makes a way for his people. Even in the wilderness, he made a way where it seemed impossible and impassable. But there was a way. God is a way. He led them forth by a straight and right way mm -hmm. through that wilderness. That pillar of cloud departed not from them day or night to lead them in the way to their destination. God is a way. And don't limit God to our way of doing things. But he says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts mm -hmm. than your thoughts. In fact, Paul says his ways are past finding out, Romans 11, 33. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his ways are past finding out. Don't limit him. He's got a way. It says here rivers. We're going to see rivers, rivers in the desert. Can you see that? Rivers in the desert. Rivers speaks of the influence of the Holy Spirit. You know, from John 7. And verse 37 and 38, it says, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and he cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. By this he spoke concerning the Spirit. Verse 39. By this he spoke concerning the spirit. I will even make rivers in the desert, in the driest of places, he can make rivers. Those dry bones can become alive. But the question is, can you see it? Can you believe for this? Can you, have you got the expectancy for this? For at the end of the day, it's all about faith. It's about faith. That's how we have to live as God's people. We sang the song, by faith. By faith. And that's how we're to live. We're to walk by faith and not by sight. The just shall live by faith. Without faith it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Do you remember the early church were referred to as Believers. They were called believers. You know, why did they see so many things happen? <laughs> they believed. It says in Acts 2, all the believers were united and had everything in common. Believers. And I love what it says in Galatians 6. It calls the church the household of faith. It says, as you have opportunity, remember, do good to all, especially those of the household of faith. God's looking for a household yeah. of faith. Absolutely. And I was reading about those meetings in Kells in Northern Ireland where they met before the revival and where they prayed and they looked at God's word. Do you know what they call those meetings? They called them Believers Fellowship Meetings. Believers Fellowship Meetings sprung up prior to the Kells revival. A remnant of believers got together. Amen. But I also remember how in Nazareth, you know, it was, it was the most privileged place on the earth, really. Especially during our Saviour's lifetime, for he spent most of his life there. But it says the people of Nazareth, they're known all over the world because of their unbelief. Mark says he could do no mighty work there, save that he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them few sick folk because of their unbelief. He could do no mighty work there because of their unbelief. And that was Jesus. Like a chilling fog of unbelief had swept over that whole community. And he marveled, it said, because of their unbelief. But by contrast, Abraham. It says he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also yeah. able to perform. Mm -hmm. 
And if you turn to your Bible, in your Bible, to, Isaiah, to Hebrews chapter 11, you can read through all the examples, the gallery of men and women of faith. For it tells me by faith Abel, because of faith Enoch. It says by faith Noah. It says by faith Abraham obeyed. By faith Sarah. By faith Isaac. By faith Jacob. By faith Joseph. By faith Moses. And then it sums it up and it says how I'm finishing tonight. It says what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell you of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Amen. Folks, can you see it? Can you perceive it? That's my prayer tonight. Let's pray. Father God, help us to step forward in faith. Father, open our eyes, the eyes of our hearts, that we can perceive revival and what you want to do in this land tonight. Father, we believe that you are doing a new thing. And we believe it is sprouting. We believe it is coming forth. But help us to pray with faith. For Father, you've given us the promise in your word. And in Mark chapter, where is it? Mark chapter uh, 12, 11. It says, Lord, you've said, have faith in God. You've said, verily I say to you, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. So, Father, help us to pray in faith. Help us to pray with expectancy. Help us to walk this out in faith to the glory of your name. Help us to walk in faith. May faith arise in our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And thank you folks for tuning in tonight.